Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cozin. And I'm Tracy McCray. There are more than 600 types of neurologic diseases that can affect your nervous system. The nervous system includes the brain, spinal cord, and nerves, which control all the workings of the body. When something goes wrong with a part of your nervous system, you can have trouble moving, speaking, swallowing, or breathing, or problems can develop with your memory, senses, or mood. In addition, there are neuromuscular disorders that involve problems with the communication between the nervous system and the muscles that they control. Are you confused? Little, I certainly am, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here to help us understand is Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Jennifer Martinez-Thompson. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Martinez-Thompson. It's nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. And you two went to medical we school did. together. Yes, we, we did. We did. We had our um, bodies, where uh, that's anatomy bodies during... <laughs> Got it. The yes. anatomy portion. <laughs> We're right next to each other. So we would occasionally kind of back up into each other. And that is true. I don't think we asked you this last time, but what made you interested in going into neurology? So neurology is all about the localization. So based on what the patients are telling you and where the issues might be, trying to localize it to a part of the nervous system really helps to target the testing so you can be very precise in the type of evaluation uh, so, for them. So I always thought that was very interesting. Like super yeah. satisfying. Yes. You have an answer. Yep. Or sometimes you don't have an answer. And sometimes you do not have an answer. <laughs> well, yeah, right. let's talk about the difference, Absolutely. the difference between a disease and a disorder. I don't want either one of them, but what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, so essentially disorder is more of an umbrella term. So it's more nonspecific. It, you may know a cause for a disorder. You may not. So it might be malfunctioning in, in the sense of nervous disorder, malfunctioning of components of the nervous system, and you don't know exactly why. Whereas a disease is more that you can tie it to a specific cause. So there might be a specific thing on pathology or a specific molecular defect that you can tie the symptoms to so you can narrow it down a little bit more. But to be honest with you, in medicine, we use those terms pretty interchangeably. So if you see disease or disorder, you can think of them almost synonymously. So what do you think about that 600 neurologic diseases? More? Oh, there's definitely more than <laughs> definitely more than 600. Definitely more. She see her eyebrows go up. Yeah, she's like, oh, ah, got right. you. So when it comes to um, the diseases, there can be lots of different causes. If it's you know a cancer or some sort of genetic disease, something like that, how do you determine what condition you're dealing with or wh which path to go down? Yeah, so that really all comes down to the visit with the neurologist. So one of the most important things is the history and the examination. So it's going back to the basics and really depending on what the patients are telling you. So when was the onset of symptoms? Did they perhaps have symptoms before that imply something that's been more longstanding? Mm -hmm. So you might think more of a genetic thing or an inherited condition, whereas things that develop quickly, you think, could it be an inflammatory thing or associated with cancer? So really the history can help guide you down the path for specific testing. And then the exam, there's specific patterns that you can see that can help you essentially determine how active a disease process might be and how rapidly it's changing. And that can help gear the evaluation a little bit more. So we were kind of thinking, you know, muscular dystrophy is not one disease, it's a group of diseases. Tell us a little bit about the different types of muscular dystrophy and what sort of that pattern that you were talking about, like what might be a presenting symptom and then what what might bring somebody in with that? Sure. So muscular dystrophy, it's, it's an umbrella term essentially for muscle diseases where there's a known genetic abnormality that affects proteins in muscle that help with the membrane of the muscle or the structure of the muscle. So even thinking of muscle disease as a more broad term, muscular dystrophy, specifically in that area. So functions of the muscle that help to maintain the structure of the muscle. Okay. So things with muscular dystrophy, there's more than 30 types. Oh, wow. Okay. And the problem is, is now in the day and age of genetic testing, where it's a lot easier to test for a broad spectrum of genes, what we're finding is the line that between muscular dystrophy and other types of muscle diseases is blurring. Okay, so it's making a little your job bit. harder. So it's making it more complicated. Uh, usually with muscular dystrophies, the onset, there's symptoms that may start in childhood mm -hmm. or in the teenage years. So patients will talk about very gradual, progressive mm -hmm. symptoms of 
weakness or loss in muscle bulk, Mm -hmm. really not with any sensation changes. And when you evaluate them, the weakness may actually be out of proportion to what they think because the symptoms have been present for so long, they're used to it and they've adapted. So you can actually pick up on more weakness than maybe what they're noticing at the functional level because their body has adapted to it. Uh, most patterns for the muscular dystrophies tend to involve the muscles that are near the shoulders and near the hips. It's like the bigger muscles. So the bigger muscle groups. And so things like standing up from a seated position, so rising out of a chair, getting in and out of a car, walking upstairs. For little kids, maybe if they're playing on the floor, standing up from that position Mm -hmm. and really trying to use those hip girdle muscles to get them standing, they may have trouble with that. Or even things like running Uh, at earlier ages might be a tip off that there's something going on. I think one of the muscular dystrophies that most people have heard about is like Deschenes, which is typically thought of little kids, right? What are some of the muscular dystrophies to be aware of that might be an older? Yeah, so so you're right. So Deschenes muscular dystrophy is the most common type that affects boys in early childhood years. So typically ages two to six or so Mm -hmm. might be when their symptoms start. Thinking beyond that, it gets more complicated again with the muscular dystrophy. So so there's different patterns that can come on in late teenage or early adulthood years. Mm -hmm. Uh, So some of the ones that you might consider are the limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So there's different genetic abnormalities in that multiple genes that have been implicated in that. Uh, And with those adults, the pattern of weakness a little bit different than what you might see in the kids. They may have where it starts in the shoulders rather than the hips. They may have their scapula, that bone that helps to support the shoulder. It may wing a little bit when they're trying to raise their arms above their head or or do functions Mm -hmm. with the arm. They may develop things like contractures where their knees, the tendons, the ligaments that help to connect the joints become very stiff and contracted. So they have decreased range of motion of certain joints. And so you can look for those subtle clues on the exam to help point to a direction where you might do testing. There's so many different forms of muscular dystrophy. Is there a cure for any of those or, or none of them have cures available? Or what do you, how do you treat them? Yeah, so it's symptomatic management, unfortunately. I mean, there are trials that are ongoing looking at different type of treatments to see if it can slow progression of disease. Really, the only thing with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that they find that might be helpful at slowing down the progression of weakness or keeping kids walking Mm -hmm. for a longer period of time is the use of steroids. So using steroids early on, what they find is that there's a modest benefit in improving the strength and And muscles. Do you think that just kind of quiets down maybe potentially an immune response? So there is inflammation that's associated Mm -hmm. with muscular dystrophy. It's thought to be a reaction to the muscle breakdown. So it's thought that by treating some of that inflammation that might be what slows things down but it's it's not a long-term benefit so at a certain point the prednisone or other steroid that you might use is not as beneficial so kind of in general these sound like these are diseases of younger people so my you know our our friends in their 50s or 60s who are saying gosh it's getting I got out of that chair. I feel kind of stiff. That's probably not muscular dystrophy, right? Correct. So okay. general rule of thumb, it's going to be longer. There are some rare forms where it can present yeah. in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. But usually when you ask, there are clues in the history that they maybe had symptoms earlier on. So even teenage years in their early 20s. And as we know more about genetics, uh, you know, the family that I know that has muscular dystrophy, it is. It does. There is a genetic component to be sure. Is there anything that is changing in the management of people's cases of muscular dystrophy or that genetics is teaching us? So I think the genetics at this point is more of understanding the mechanism for why the muscle disease is happening in these families to begin with. So a lot of the work that's being done is to try to improve the detection of Mm -hmm. these different... So every year you're discovering more and more genetic abnormalities and tying them to different muscle diseases that previously couldn't be associated with a specific genetic abnormality. I think once that phase is done, really a goal is going to be trying to target treatments based on the genetic abnormalities, Mm -hmm. but we're not there at this point. 
We're talking about neurologic diseases, including muscular dystrophy, with Mayo Clinic neurologist Dr. Jennifer Martinez Thompson. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll turn our attention to another disease of the nervous system multiple sclerosis. And, and yes, oh, myth or fact, myth or matter of fact, if my MS isn't causing symptoms, I don't need treatment yet. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Tracy McRae. And I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cozine. We've been talking with Mayo Clinic neurologist Dr. Jennifer Martinez-Thompson about neurologic diseases. We've covered muscular dystrophy, and now we're going to turn our attention to multiple sclerosis. So let's do that myth or matter of fact. Myth or matter of fact. Oh, wait, okay, say so, Dr. Martinez-Thompson. Myth or matter of fact. If my MS isn't causing symptoms, I don't need treatment. Is that a myth or a fact? So that's a myth. But looking at the question carefully, it can be a complicated situation in MS because there is a spectrum of how people present with MS from the range where they may have clinical symptoms or where they have a brain scan for another reason and lesions that look like MS lesions are discovered incidentally. And then the question becomes in those patients, do you treat them or not? Mm -hmm. So in patients that have had symptoms in the past, likely they're going to need to be on some type of treatment to try to decrease uh, risk of MS attacks in the future. So how are MS and MD, muscular dystrophy, how are they different from each other? Oh, it's <laughs> completely different ends of the spectrum. So what we were talking about with muscular dystrophy is more targeting the muscle, muscle level, yeah. right? So an issue with the muscle itself and the proteins of the muscle. MS is a central nervous system disorder, by that meaning that it affects the brain and the spinal cord. And so MS, while we don't understand the cause for it, it is thought to be an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. where the mm -hmm. body essentially attacks the fatty covering that acts as insulation from the nerves as they're traveling through the brain and into the spinal cord. So that's called the myelin. So it's thought to be a demyelinating, loss of myelin mm -hmm. type of syndrome. So what does the name tell us? Multiple sclerosis. So what multiple means, it involves multiple parts of the mm -hmm. central nervous system. So when you back in the day when it was initially described and people in autopsy looking at a bra at brain mm -hmm. under the microscope, they noticed that there were lesions in different portions of the brain and in the spinal cord. Sclerosis meaning that they look like plaques. Mm -hmm. so almost like a scar that was left behind. And so that's how the name was born. Yeah. And if MS is an autoimmune disease, multiple uh, MD is not though. That's not an autoimmune disease. That is not. So that is based on genetics. Okay. Whereas MS is a completely different uh, so area. So is there any genetics involved in MS? So I think there are some studies looking at the possibility mm -hmm. of genetics in MS. What we know at this point that it does not really travel in families. Mm -hmm. So there's not clear family preponderance. But there, if there's a family history of autoimmune disease, so people with thyroid disease mm -hmm. or other types of mm -hmm. autoimmune disease, that there may be an increased risk for MS. Tell us a little bit about how you diagnose MS. So MS, again similar to muscular dystrophy, depends a lot on the history and clinical examination. Mm -hmm. So it's a clinical diagnosis. And so people will typically present with symptoms that are more rapidly changing than, for mm -hmm. example, in muscular dystrophy. So over days or weeks, they'll develop numbness or tingling of the face, arm, and legs. Uh, they can have issues where they have painful vision loss mm -hmm. involving an eye. They can have bowel or bladder dysfunction with that, or they can have weakness involving a side of the body or both legs, mm -hmm. depending what level of the nervous system is involved. So when you hear that type of story and the symptoms evolving over days to weeks, that's one of the things that you consider. So you look for specific patterns on the exam that will point you to that. And really what the testing that you do to diagnose is to confirm what your suspicion is. So okay. for diagnosis, it'll include MRI, so MRI looking at the brain and at the spinal cord. And really what you're trying to do is to look for lesions that look characteristic of MS within the areas where there's that myelin in the brain and spinal cord. Because so we when call you that say, the white matter. When you say central nervous system, that's not just the brain. That's also the spinal exactly. cord. Exactly. So, so it also includes the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So you'd be looking at both of those components. Uh, then there's usually a spinal tap that's involved, looking for signs where there might be 
uh, inflammation or something that tells mm-hmm. you that the immune system is active at that time. So specific things that you'd look at in the spinal tap. And then you can actually test how the nerves uh, conduct electricity through responses, either through the visual pathways into the brain or from the pathways in the arm and the leg and measure the electricity, how it's conducted up those nerves through the spinal cord up to the brain and look for slowing there that tells you that myelin, that insulation is Mm. not quite wrapped around the nerves the way that it should be. So those are, those tests are called evoked potentials. And so looking at all that testing together can help you confirm the diagnosis. And of course, you'd want to rule out other alternative infections or other inflammatory type conditions that could look similar to that. So can you cure MS or do you manage the disease? So there's not a cure, Mm -hmm. but you manage the disease. And unlike muscular dystrophy in MS, there are a lot of treatments available. Mm -hmm. And that could be a whole other topic on its own because there's so many different disease modifying therapies mm-hmm. out there to help control the disease and it really depends on how aggressive the disease is for mm-hmm. a patient so how many ms attacks there are how severe each of those attacks are when they do the the brain and the spinal cord imaging does it look like there's a lot of active lesions so all of those factors have to be weighed in and deciding what the type uh, t- uh, right type of treatment would be so there are treatments that you can give actively when someone's in an attack to try to reduce the time that they're in that attack like steroids or things where you might wash the blood like mm-hmm. a plasma exchange And then for more long-term control of the disease, uh, there's injectable therapies, oral tablets, there's infusions, there's a lot of different treatments available that you would give with really the main goal of trying to reduce the risk of relapses in the future, so another MS attack, and trying to reduce the number of lesions that you'd see on the scans, because that's the longer-term goal. You don't want those lesions to continue building because you don't want it to become more of a progressive disease in the future. So if a young person were diagnosed with MS, there's quite a, sounds like there's a lot of reason to be hopeful that they could do really well. Absolutely. And in many cases of MS, the attacks tend to be mild. So there's a broad spectrum in what you see. Most cases, people do very well with long-term management of of the disease. There's only the rare cases where they may have more severe presentation. Mm. We were talking about uh, muscular dystrophy having so many different types, you know, 30 plus different types. Is How many types of MS are there? That's a, that's a good question. And it depends, I guess, how you define MS. But sure. thinking of MS, there's types in the way that people present, but it's really all under the same disease. Okay. So the most common type is what we call relapsing remitting. So that's that classic type where people develop symptoms. Mm-hmm. After some weeks, they stabilize things remit, improve, and then they may have an attack in the future. So that's the classic form. There are others where from the start or later on in the disease, it sort of develops more progressively. So Mm -hmm. month by month, they develop some progressive. Instead of of a quick attack and then improvement, it's just kind of gradual worsening over time. For those, there are some treatments available, but there's not as many as for the relapsing remitting form. But also not a cure. But it's also not a cure. And there's, there's lots of research, though, that's being done. Is that being done to find a cure or to help manage, help patients manage? Uh, both. Mm-hmm. So it's not only looking forward. Are there ways that you can modify the disease itself, so looking for cure, but also are there ways to better manage the, the yeah. symptoms and the disease activity? That's, that's really definitely amazing. a very active field. So, Anything else? No, it's just All right. really interesting. Dr. Jennifer Martinez Thompson has been with us discussing neurologic diseases and neuromuscular disorders, including muscular dystrophy and multiple sclerosis. Thanks for joining us again, Dr. Martinez Thompson. Thanks for having me.